Here. Jeffrey Downs. Present. Natalie Bird. Joseph Lenski. Here. Scott Budnick. Here. Thomas Epstein. Here. Cecilia Estolano. Present. Danny Hawkins. Good afternoon. Lance Azumi. Here. Deborah Malamed. Gary Reed. Nancy Sumner. Present. Colin Van Loon. Present. Uh, this is November and this is Veterans Month, even though it's Veterans uh, Year, Veterans Month all year round. But uh, uh, Colonel Nancy uh, Sumner, our uh, board member, retired Air Force uh, Colonel, please could you lead us in the pledge? Place your hand over your heart. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible. Thank you very much. Uh, first, I want to begin by thanking uh, Chancellor Thor. Uh, where are you at? There you are. Thank you very much for having us here, uh, President uh, Murphy, uh, and of course the trustees. And uh, thank Donna Jones Doolin for providing that, uh, that wonderful tour for us. Uh, we're very happy to be here. I uh, just want to report on a few things that I've uh, been involved in uh, over the last couple of months. In addition to those uh, things that I've done on my, uh, my own campuses, uh, both Mount Sac and, and, and Rio Hondo, I have done some things on behalf of the Board of Governors and in conjunction with others on the Board of Governors. On October 10th, I was uh, with the Riverside Chamber of Commerce. Um, the uh, the leadership there, uh, CEO uh, Cindy Roth and, and, and Chamber President Rod uh, Redfern uh, asked us to, to speak there on legislative and higher education issues, and I was one of the keynotes along with uh, CSU Chancellor Tim White, uh, CSU Board President Lou Monville, who used to be on this, this board, uh, and also Assemblyman Jose Medina and State Senator Richard Roth had a very nice uh, reception there uh, and uh, luncheon and uh, discussed uh, the latest things that are happening, particularly with the CSU and uh, the community colleges and then also um, uh, uh, the legislation in general. Uh, on November 3rd, I, I uh, uh, was asked to speak to career counselors at Career Cafe over at the Sheraton Cerritos. Uh, they are meeting today. They, 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 that was the north, uh, southern area career counselors, and they are meeting today as we are here. Um, but in Sacramento, to, to discuss the uh, role of career counselors in student success. And I want to thank Rita Jones, who's from the Coast District and the coordinator and the advisor committee for uh, career development for the state. Uh, and uh, over this past weekend, I did attend the Academic Senate Plenary over at Irvine Marriott. And uh, I want to thank uh, uh, President David Morris and, and uh, Julie Bornstein, Vice President Julie Bornstein, and of course with the work of the CEO for the Senate, uh, Julie Adams. Uh, the the uh, Academic Senate, the Statewide Academic Senate, of course, very important in providing professional development for the system. And, uh, you know, we'll, we will be talking uh, about this uh, maybe later this afternoon or tomorrow. Uh, but uh, the Academic Senate plays a significant role in terms of uh, providing uh, uh, the, the awareness, uh, the knowledge that's necessary in order to run our many, many programs, whether it be transfer, career, uh, or other areas, and certainly an instrumental part in student success, uh, the Student Success Initiative. Um, members uh, Estolano and Member Sumner and I uh, visited a couple campuses a couple months ago, and one of them was Mount Sac, and, and specifically we were interested in looking at the Vet Center. And, and both uh, Mount Sac and Citrus, which was the other college we attended, both have made uh, major steps in terms of providing uh, accommodations and services for veterans. So we were very pleased with, <clears throat> with the reception that we got, uh, particularly at Citrus. Uh, Mount Sac's my, my home campus is a trustee, so uh, we, we, uh, I, I did kind of the tour. But at Citrus College, uh, President Jerry uh, Perry and, and uh, trustees uh, Rasmussen, Montgomery, and Dickerson were there to uh, uh, host us and, and to give us a tour of the campus, so very appreciative of that. And I just want to close with one other uh, item related to veterans, 
and that is that the VET Summit is going to be held in, at the San Jose Marriott here in this area on December 4th and 5th, and uh, we're expecting a very uh, good turnout for that, uh, that event as we have over the last uh, uh, four years, uh, three, four years. And uh, just want to give thanks uh, particularly to uh, Majestic Realty, who will once again provide sponsorship for this event, and uh, thank the work of uh, David Lawrence and Linda Makalowski in terms of putting all of the energy in, 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 into this. And I, I believe that we're still co-sponsoring with maybe one other person or one other group that maybe I've left out. Uh, fact, yeah, if, certainly the Faculty Association, of course. Uh, and uh, so um, that will be on December 4th and 5th at the San Jose Marriott. And uh, thank you all very much for being here. Chancellor? Thank you, President Baca, members of the board. Um, first, a uh, little clarification. This is a somewhat new format on your agenda, and uh, there have been a couple of folks who, who have thought we were going to get all this done this afternoon. Let me assure you that's uh, not the case. Uh, on the uh, front uh, cover of the agenda, it does uh, say we're meeting today until approximately 5 and tomorrow between 9 and 2, and we certainly uh, do not expect uh, to get all this agenda done today. What we've tried to do with this new format is uh, l lessen the confusion, and maybe uh, at least for the first time around it's made it a bit more confusing. So uh, just let me assure you that, that we're not going to power through this entire agenda between now and 5 o'clock. Uh, secondly, I'd, I'd like to uh, thank the uh, folks at the uh, San Diego Community College District and the Compton uh, Community uh, College Center of El Camino for hosting a visit uh, for the Chancellor's Circle and uh, campus visit uh, a few weeks back. It was very enjoyable. Uh, both those uh, institutions are uh, very, very different in some ways and very alike in others. It was a pleasure and uh, wonderful to be hosted out at our campuses. I uh, had the sad duty uh, a few weeks back of representing California's community colleges at the uh, memorial service for former <clears throat> State Chancellor David Murray's. David uh, served uh, a number of years ago as Chancellor of the System for about eight years and uh, certainly led with distinction. Uh, most notably, David was Chancellor uh, when 1725 was passed and then uh, the first several years of its implementation oversaw that. It was a, a, an exciting period in California Community College history, and David was certainly a key player in all of that. He will, he will be missed. Uh, next, uh, Thursday and Friday of this week, actually, uh, the, and over the weekend, the League Conference will be held uh, in Southern California, and I expect we'll see many of the faces uh, here today there as well. I would say to all of you that... Uh, the Board of Governors plans to host a reception on Thursday evening, and that's open to anyone attending the conference. So it uh, follows immediately after the gala reception, and uh, we would encourage all of you uh, to attend that Board of Governors reception. It gives you a great opportunity to meet and interact with the Board, and, and I think all but a couple of the Board members are able to make that reception, so it promises to be a, a great uh, opportunity. Um, I'd like uh, at this time to ask uh, a colleague to come uh, forward uh, to briefly uh, make a, a bit of a special presentation. Uh, Dr. Ron uh, Tavernack, who is the Vice President of Student Services at Ohlone College, but uh, uh, in this uh, case he's acting as the President of the uh, Student Services Officers, and he has a uh, quick comment to make. Ron? Please. Thank you. Thank you, Chancellor, and thank you, Board, for this couple of moments in your time. I, uh, I will try to make it brief. I see your agenda is very rich. Um, Alexander Austin, in his book, Four Critical Years, defined community happening during crisis and celebration. And I think the last few years have certainly represented numerous crises that this Board, the community colleges, and we in student services have certainly had to deal with and willingly dealt with. Um, managing workload reductions, budget challenges, implementing orientation priorities, um, triple SP and equity plans, all at the same time uh, has really been a daunting task and a particular challenge for the student service areas. So that was the crisis side. Um, during that time, the CSSO uh, group, and in particular um, the, the, uh, the executive board, has acknowledged and worked with 
uh, someone in this office, in the Chancellor's office, uh, constantly, and that is Linda Maslowski. Um, we want to acknowledge her leadership and her support during that time uh, as tremendous. We want to take this opportunity to acknowledge how vital that support has been to us as individuals and as an association. Um, Linda was able during the last few years that I've been involved with the executive team uh, to communicate constantly, both individually and collectively with us. Uh, it's been invaluable in allowing us to make strides on these many, many new ideas and mandates. I can honestly say for the CSSO group, we're glad for Linda. We truly are. We're sad for ourselves. And we're a little mad to figure out how in the world we are going to go on uh, without her here. Um, we decided as a group um, that it's so hard for us to lose touch with our mentor, our guide, our friend, and our advisor that we wanted to give her a small token of our esteem in the way of an Apple uh, gift certificate at the store. Linda, you can use this uh, either for hardware or uh, to uh, help you at the Genius Bar as much as needed. Uh, but what we want you to do is to stay in touch with us. Linda, after three decades, congratulations on your retirement. Thank you, Ron. As all of you know, Linda is going to make a, an exit uh, before the end of the calendar year. We have uh, some other things uh, planned to acknowledge her tremendous contribution, but Ron and the CSSOs wanted to do this today, and, and Ron, thank you very much. That concludes my report. President Baca. Thank you, Chancellor. We will now move on to the consent calendar, and I'll entertain a motion to uh, approve the consent uh, calendar. Okay. Uh, I would yes. like to ask that item 1.1, number 2, be pulled so we can discuss that. I have some questions on it. Very well. Uh, approval of the consent calendar with the exception of item 1.1. I move. And I do want to ask a question, but not necessarily to okay. be pulled on number 3. Just on which one? Number 3, grant 3. Oh, I see. Okay. 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 Is that part of Okay. Uh, member... Lance Asumi, uh, uh, motion second. Second. Okay, uh, discussion. At, uh, all, all in favor, please indicate by saying aye, and then we'll go to 1.1. Aye. 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 Okay. Uh, consent calendar is, is uh, approved, uh, item 1.2. And now I'll entertain a motion for consent uh, <coughs> item 1.1. I could have a motion, please, and then uh, a second. So moved. Okay, Member Epstein, second. Member Asumi, a discussion. Member Hawkins? Uh, actually, I was out of, I got my notes wrong. It was 1.2, number oh. 2, that I wanted to ask the question on. So. That's all right. Let's go ahead it, and approve this one. Then. Okay, let's, uh, let's prove it, and then we'll go back to that okay, one. Thank all you. right. All in favor of item 1.1, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Okay. Uh, okay to go to a discussion? Yeah. The okay. Item number uh, 2 of uh, 1.2 talked about the sixth floor, and I, being a technology person, I do mm -hmm. understand the need for infrastructure, but what's the status of us moving to the sixth floor, and did we need to do this today? Well, the status of us moving to the sixth floor is in, in limbo. Um, we have had a number of conversations and had, had a, an agreed-upon lease, which we have signed, and uh, the leaseholder at uh, the 11th hour is trying to decide whether he wants to sell the building or not. And so we're uh, sort of in limbo, and what's that's, what that's caused us to do is begin to investigate other opportunities, which we started doing last month. So... Uh, Patrick Perry, uh, Executive Vice Chancellor, is leading that effort. Uh, Deputy Chancellor Skinner and I and a number of others are involved. But um, right now, we are not homeless, but we're close. <laughs> Thank you. 
Vice President Baum. So I, pr I presume this contract is an authorization in the event that we move, not an obligation to expend those resources. That's correct, yeah. So we, that was on my only question. Okay. Joseph had a question on another item. Do you have a question? Number three. And my question is simply because this is about the Institutional Effectiveness and Technical Assistance Program, which is, from my point of view, new. So, and it's through the State Chancellor's Office also. Will we be getting regular kind of updates as to what's, you know, happening and the kinds of things that are coming forward from the colleges, and uh, particularly because it's got like accreditation, fiscal viability, uh, programmatic compliance? Absolutely. Uh, in fact, I, I would imagine in either your January or March meeting, you'll get a pretty in-depth uh, okay. in report on the entire project. We wanted to wait until this grant was awarded and we could begin to work with the uh, successful uh, awardee. And, uh, and that happened, as you know, today. And, and so now we will uh, begin that process and we'll be back to you e in either January or March with a more robust conversation. Okay, thank you. Anything else, uh, Mr. President? Mark? You said that happened. Did, is there a, uh, an awardee? Yes. Okay. Uh, Santa Clarita Community College District, College of the Canyons. Okay. Oh, here it is. So that's the, at our desk. Is there anything else? And now we'll move on. Uh, the consent calendar is approved, both items. So we'll move on to uh, action, uh, the action items. Before we... Uh, Proceed with uh, item uh, 2.1. I, I just want to indicate that uh, we will have a presentation, but following immediately after the presentation, if we can have a motion from the from the board to take action, then we'll have a discussion afterwards. Okay. So uh, with that, we'll go to action item: a presentation on the Board of Governors Task Force on Workforce Job Creation and uh, and a Strong Economy. The item request approval of the Task Force on Workforce Job Creation and Strong Economy. Chancellor. Thank you, President Baca, members of the board. As you will recall, going back uh, now a little bit more than a year ago to your uh, initial retreat in, uh, in 2012 and then followed again uh, this year in uh, the retreat and subsequent board meetings, um, the system is uh, interested in looking very seriously, as the board has directed us to, at our career tech education program statewide and our workforce and economic development uh, activities. Uh, we have had doing what matters for jobs in the economy underway for quite some time under the leadership of Vice Chancellor uh, Ton Quinn Levin, who will uh, give you more details on this item. But this is an exciting uh, launch today. If the board uh, approves, we will move forward with uh, an initiative not dissimilar from the uh, level of uh, emphasis we had on the student success initiative. So, uh, Vaughn? Uh, thank you very much, Chancellor Harris. Uh, uh, Chairman Baca and members of the board. Uh, I just came back from uh, Washington, D.C., and in the conversation with uh, policymakers, one of them shared that last week there was uh, an event, a gathering of the four-year system uh, on the topic of higher education and innovation. And they remarked that what, there was apparently uh, a most striking difference between this year and prior year, and that the four-year systems are now asking the question, what do employers want? What do employers want? So this is a remarkable, what they said was a remarkable sea change, that the four-year systems had also this common interest in workforce. And so the conversation on workforce is not limited to us, but given the size and normandy and the role that we play, we definitely need to be at the lead. And so congratulations for having um, had this discussion and teeing up this issue. Um, so today, uh, as mentioned by the Chancellor, we are asking you to formally commission the task force as discussed at the September um, retreat, and we will preview uh, the rollout for you of this initiative uh, that you've asked us to, to prepare. So as uh, if you remember, the, uh, the, the task force on workforce job creation and strong economy will be focused on considering strategies and recommending policies and practices that would prepare students for high-value jobs that currently exist in California, position California's regions to attract high-value jobs from other states and around the globe, create more jobs to workforce training that enables small business creation, 
and finance these initiatives by braiding state and federal resources. And based on your comments, we are also adding an additional lens, which is that we are particularly interested through this process of identifying recommendations that engender flexibility, regional responsiveness, partnership with industry, and student portability. So we're going to put that, those additional lens on ideas. And uh, a refresher on the, uh, the slide that uh, Chancellor Harris had put out, but with a little bit more color. As part of the uh, sequences, sequencing of the major initiatives, you all had led the uh, Student Success Task Force, which resulted in 22 recommendations that went into implementation. And then the, this is an evolution, again, for our system to, to take what has been laid out with the Student Success Task Force, as well as the Doing What Matters for Jobs and Economy framework, to identify recommendations in, by the task force in 2015 and then go into a phase of implementation. So again, these are major initiatives led by you um, and they're being phased in uh, appropriately. So here's the, the third page uh, is the proposal to roll out this task force. And we have uh, met with the consultation council twice now to uh, gather uh, input. And it's our recommendation that we roll this out through a three-phase process so that we can uh, be as inclusive and get as much feedback as possible, having learned from the uh, Student Success uh, Task Force Initiative. So today, if you can commission the task force, what that will begin to trigger is phase one, which would be a set of regional college conversations where we bring together the practitioners at the college level within their region to surface these ideas and, and, and uh, recommendations. Then in phase two, we'd like to roll up these recommendations, see if there's commonalities, if there's nuances amongst the regions, and then bring it out into a set of strong workforce town halls co-hosted by external stakeholders, our friends in the, uh, the chamber community, uh, economic development community, so that we can vet some of these ideas uh, and, and uh, uh, have a discussion on what matters to them. Because as you know, in workforce, it's, it's a combination of interests of all our internal and external stakeholders. And then th that list is what we bring to the work, uh, the, the, to the task force so that we can deep dive into the areas uh, uh, that we've heard through these series of conversation. And then our expectation is that by the end of the July, August timeframe, a set of recommendations will go to consultation council then be brought before you in uh, September. So let me just pause there to see if there's any questions regarding the, the three phases. If you can just proceed through through uh, your presentation, then we'll uh, get Help into questions after that. Okay, thank you. So composition of the task force, as you know, we, uh, uh, we want to have the array of voices from our own system, from faculty, staff, student, administrators, trustees, and then also blended with the uh, external stakeholders who depend on our system, uh, employer, labor community, public agencies that focus on workforce training and economic development, the K-12 education policy, and community-based organization. Uh, for the internal system uh, membership, we intend to go through the major organizations that represent these uh, constituents to, to secure a, nominate, uh, a nominee or nominations. Uh, so that would be the composition of the workforce, very similar to what we discussed at the retreat. And just to give you a, a sense of these regional conversations, which is phase one, uh, we have uh, asked a, a set of CEOs who are in region to help us co-host and to organize the logistics of these events. And why I put this in front of you is you know, all, many of you have relationship with these college CEOs and you'll want to thank them for, for responding to the, the requests from the board. Uh, and, and secondly is to give the URL where people can RSVP to these events. So for each of these conversations, we plan to have uh, an in-region call us host, uh, like Judy Miner, who's, who's co-hosting the Bay Region, um, someone from the Chancellor's Office, as well as someone from the Academic Senate to kick off all of these events. It's a support structure. We heard from you uh, a number of areas where we want, may want to have a committee structure or, or um, be able to dive more deeply into the, the topics. 
And so, of course, uh, we have uh, the chancellor and the deputy chancellor. Uh, th there are a number of us here all on the on the left all queued up to be supporting different issue areas as we begin to tackle that. And then um, we have a support structure in terms of communications and media, legislative and uh, briefing of the governor's office, uh, facilitation, documentation, logistics, and even philanthropic outreach. So uh, as you can see that the agency is, is being queued up to support uh, this agenda you, you've asked us to take on. And so lastly, the goal. The goal is to increase individual, individual and regional economic competitiveness by providing California's workforce with relevant skills and quality credentials that match employer needs and fuel a strong economy. So strong workforce is our nickname. And so that ends my presentation. Thank you very much. Before we proceed to discussion, uh, I will entertain a motion for the approval of a task force on workforce job creation and a strong economy. So moved. Okay, uh, Vice President Baum, motion. Second by uh, Member uh, Isumi. Uh, discussion. Member Hawkins. Thank you, President Baca. Uh, the, while I think this is great and, and a long time coming, I would just caution the Chancellor and the Board, I would like to see more than one classified staff member representing the entire state and also more than one student if we're basing it on what we did for the Student Success Task Force. Not exactly an opportune model in, in my opinion. Thank you. Uh, we'll have one more question from the board and then uh, we'll go to public comment and then return to, to uh, board comments. Uh, Member Bandum? Uh, yes, this might be more of a question for Vice Chancellor Feast. Um, I was just wondering if we've developed any marketing strategies to appeal to businesses um, to attend these um, town hall meetings in particular, because obviously this is contingent upon partnerships with those businesses, so thorough involvement in, um, in those communities of the businesses that are in those communities is obviously necessary. Um, I know, for instance, uh, my district is partnered with PG&E and we were able to develop um, a Power Pathways program uh, in which entailed a 95% higher rate uh, with PG&E uh, through that CTE program. So without those businesses, um, we, we won't have that higher rate. And so we have, have we uh, developed any strategies to outreach to them? Vice Chancellor uh, Von Tonkwilliman and her communications contract agency developed a strat uh, media strategy, a, a communication strategy, which involves um, the setup of a, actually a website that's going to go up later today and also outreach and uh, the, the uh, organization of these town halls and reaching out to the, our partners in, in the business community to get their input. So, for example, Member uh, Van Loon, uh, in the Bay Area, the Silicon Valley Leadership Group has agreed to co-host the Strong Town Hall meeting there. So they'll be turning out their membership in addition with uh, the folks from internal to the system. So we're going to take that strategy for the strong workforce town halls. Thank you. Thank you very much. Before we proceed with member uh, discussion, uh, Vice President Baum, public comment. Uh, we have David Morse followed by Jonathan Lightman. President Baca, uh, Chancellor Harris, board members. The Academic Senate is very supportive of the creation of the Task Force on Workforce, Job Creation, and a Strong Economy. This task force is an important opportunity for necessary conversations on workforce development and the development of our career technical education programs. However, we are concerned that before the task force has even been formed, discussions have already taken place that would attempt to direct its work towards certain conclusions and outcomes. We very much appreciate that Vice Chancellors Tan Quinlivan and Walker are working collegially with us to address these concerns. Nevertheless, we caution that the amount of preparatory work, including numerous regional meetings and town hall meetings, should not do more than simply provide a context for the task force. Otherwise, it may constrain the task force discussions by defining in advance not only what questions the task force will consider, but implicitly what recommendations will be developed. The Academic Senate recognizes the importance of the task force and wants its work to succeed. We are sensitive to the constraints of the now concluding fall semester or quarter here in the Foothill De Anza District. 
And, but we know that the task force's efforts will not be credible if they are seen as having been predetermined or directed. We hope that the task force will be allowed to deliberate fully and to explore issues with openness to all alternatives in order to achieve the best possible outcome. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Lightman. Uh, good afternoon, Chancellor Harris and President Baca, member of the Board of Governors. Um, I was asked by the, uh, the President of the California Community College Association for Occupational Education to lend their support for the task force uh, and, and to share with you that within the world of CTE, they are suffering from grant fatigue. And they want to know that there is going to be some certainty in their programs, it's not going to be based necessarily on who is able to write the best grants. In particular, that th since we know that this is also countercyclical, that the programs are most needed when the economy falters, that they are not the first to be cut when times are harsh. Um, with that, the task force is also consistent with the uh, desires of the legislature, which has been expressed this past year by Assembly Concurrent Resolution 119. Um, I would concur with my colleague David Morse that, um, as uh, Vice Chancellor uh, Von Ton Quinlevin mentioned, that there were some lessons learned from the Student Success Task Force. And we, we do agree that we don't want any of the uh, pre conversations to prejudice the openness or, or the ability of the task force members to actually set the product. Thank you. Thank you. One more? One more. Uh, no, that's oh, it. That's for public that comment. ends public comment. Uh, Vice President Baugh? I have a, a few questions. First off, I'm enthusiastic about uh, the establishment of this task force. It was an issue that actually came up. I'm going through the Senate confirmation process and the, the Senate Rules Committee and the, the, the leadership there indicated that workforce is very important to them and they're looking for solutions to some of the, the problems and the challenges that we, we face. I have a few questions too. Also, given the legislature's role and interest in this process, uh, with the Student Success Task Force, we did have legislation representation on the task force. I don't see that here and I was wondering why and uh, maybe if it's something we should consider. So that's my first question. Thank you, uh, Vice President Obama. We did uh, talk at length about uh, the potential for having legislative representation. The reason we, at least at this point, have opted not to do that, in the case of the Student Success Task Force, that legislative representation was actually, at the time, Senator Liu, who had sponsored the legislation on outcomes-based funding that spawned the task force in the first place, and that was the linkage uh, between her office and the task force. In this case, we expect that at the uh, end of this process, there's very likely to be legislation needed to enact some of the work of the task force. And so we'd like to uh, keep from sort of presupposing what senator or assembly member might be asked to carry that legislation. If we put one of them on the task force, that, that it, I think it makes it difficult to do that. Now, we will have a requirement, obviously, to keep the uh, legislative leadership and the leadership in the governor's office well informed at every step of the way of the task force, but we've chosen at this point not to actually put a legislator on the task force. Sure. It would be my hope that we, we are active, as you said, so that we have a, a chance of buy-in to the result rather than, than feeling excluded from the process, because it's clearly on their radar, and I think as other members of the Board of Governors go through the confirmation process, you will hear the same thing from the legislature. Another um, issue that I wanted to – it seems like there's a number of efforts towards uh, investing in initiatives in workforce training and development. I'm, I passed along something to you uh, set up by the Southern California Leadership Camp uh, uh, organization uh, that is chaired by Governors Wilson, Duke Majin, and Davis. That They're working on poverty and workforce training. How are we going to make sure that our effort is uh, – is empowered by all these threads of activity when it comes to workforce as opposed to competing or duplicative of other initiatives that are happening within the business community, within the other parts of education and other communities like that. How do we do that? So, Member Baum, the Southern California um, Association of Governments, the mm -hmm. SCAG, which uh, held that event and is sponsoring that set of activities, uh, they are one of the members that we'd like to invite onto the task force in order to integrate their voice. And uh, we've had preliminary 
discussions with them uh, to host a strong workforce town hall uh, as, a, as a way to integrate their voice into us and our voice into their work as well. So as long as I, I believe, I hope that we're well aware of all the different initiatives that seem to be uh, starting and going on for a number of years that uh, we're engaging in incorporating and building on those strengths as opposed to creating yet another competing kind of initiative on workforce training and development. Too, because I, I learned during my meeting with the Senate rules too, the UC system is beginning to say, no, we're all about workforce uh, uh, training and development, which was refreshing and exciting to hear, but I want to make sure that we're in alignment with all of those as, as well. You know, uh, let, me, let me add a comment on that. I, I think that, uh, and it goes to uh, one of the comments that Jonathan Lightman made a moment ago, I think that uh, one of the things we've realized in the last few years is that this is a very vulcanized um, system of delivery of career tech education, workforce education, not only uh, in California but across the country. And we're finding the states that succeed in both braiding the funding and coordinating and cooperating among the various agencies that are involved, that's where the, the, uh, the most exciting work is taking place. So you put your finger on one of the greatest challenges that we will have to um, face with the task force, and that is making sure that the work is not yet just another uh, uh, small initiative, but instead uh, co-ops and cooperates with a number of other things that are going on in the state. Because we're going to even have the for-profit sector saying we're all about workforce preparation as well. Two final quick points. One, one of the uh, elements to success for the Student Success Task Force, I felt, was hiring a full-time staff person of the caliber of Amy Supinger, who could help bring a lot of the, uh, the work together. And is that in the uh, uh, mix for this, that we'll be able to raise the funds to have somebody fully devoted to this task force and marshalling it through? The resources, uh, we're, what, what we're looking at is deploying a singular person to help with the facilitation and a, another person with the documentation that would, would travel across all of these three phases so that we can have uh, consistency um, and, and backup and focus on, on these discussions. Um, so we're, we're deploying uh, s the support services in that way. And then uh, you know, Vice Chancellor Walker, myself, and the other Vice Chancellor, depending on the topic, will begin, will staff a, a series of these issues. I'm just hoping that there's somebody who's virtually entirely 100% devoted to this to make sure that it, it gets through. That, that, those are my questions. All right. Any other? No. Member Stong? Yeah. Thank you for the presentation. How's that? Can you see me? Okay. Thanks for the presentation, uh, Vice Chancellor. I have a few questions. Um, so you flashed on the screen the, the, the regional conversations that have already been set, um, and then there's a website. I just want to make sure people understand that that will be updated as you schedule more of them, and people can just refer to the website, correct? To, yes. Right. So, so right now it looks like there's three scheduled for the Bay Area and like one for San Diego. That's just a function of what's been scheduled to date. There will be others. Maybe you could elaborate on that. Yes, so what we've done is, uh, in order to uh, avoid, you know, uh, sort of version creeps, we are launching, you know, after you commission this uh, task force, uh, a website, and it will list all the events, all three phases of events and the logistics. And as we begin to fill out the logistics, we'll continue to update the website. That's great, because I'm sure it's, it's iterative. And then more specifically on the three phases, it looks like on this timeline that the regional college conversations really span December to January, right? And that was in your memo. But it also looks from the previous schedule that some of them go into February. Maybe those are part of the town halls. So when I first read the staff report, my concern was that the regional college conversations were happening at like the worst time of the year, which is December to January. So will that, does that include the entire month of January? Right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Okay. Yes, uh, they are spanning between November, actually technically they span a little bit of November, December, January, and, and we have a few hitting in early February. February. We're trying to get them all in. The key is to get them all in before the town halls occur so that we can identify common themes. Okay, and then the town halls will start launching beginning in February, February through the end of March. That's and my point being it's not all going to be happening during the holiday season, the That's original right. holiday. Okay. Um, and then another point is I think uh, 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 board members 
uh, point about wanting to make sure that there was more than one student representative and more than one staff representative. Likewise, I think it's essential that we have a number of employer representatives um, spanning a number of key sectors. And I'd like to get your thoughts on how those employer representatives will be selected, how many do you imagine, um, how big is this task force anticipated to be, Mr. Chancellor? Yeah, well, that, that is the, uh, the very difficult challenge uh, by nature of the size of California and the variety of industries represented. We do see the task force, uh, we're trying to, to keep its size uh, in the mid-20s, okay. um, and we do uh, expect about half of it to be representative of uh, employers and about half of it representative of our system. And uh, Vice Chancellor Tan Quinn Libin's done a, a great deal of work in trying to identify people that would span multiple um, industries and or multiple constituent groups and stakeholders. And so it, it, our goal will be to, to make certain that both the receivers of our, our students and the work we do um, are well represented as uh, is the, uh, the system itself. And then just a couple more points, um, I'm almost done. Um, on the issue that uh, our Vice President Baum raised about kind of how broken this system is and just there's so many other initiatives going on around workforce, it's become the flavor of the month since the recession. Now everybody cares about workforce development, which I remember six years ago, nobody cared about workforce development. So that's a good thing. Our time is in the sun now. Um, the one thing I would want to underscore for our, me, our, our fellow board members is in all of those conversations, and Vice Chancellor, please give me your thoughts on this, the community college system is always viewed as the fulcrum of the system. Mm -hmm. And usually in these conversations in these different sectors as they're rolling out their initiatives and their, their conversations, they almost always include the community colleges because it's t typically viewed as the key player in workforce development. So I think we're going to be okay. I mean, we've been at the center. I know the SCAG conversation that you mentioned, uh, Vice President Baum. I know um, the Vice Chancellor uh, von Tan Quinlevin was part of that conversation. So could you just maybe talk a little bit about how many invitations you get to be in everybody's various initiatives and dialogues? Because I, I, I see your name pop up all the time in these forums. Well, hopefully this uh, process will make me less busy because uh, we will have so many people who have had the conversation they can represent their issues, you know, in, 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 the, in their respective bodies. Um, I, I think our challenge with the workforce is uh, to really embrace the workforce mission and where do we find the pain points, you know, for our colleges and our practitioners out there and to be able to identify those to bring it to the Board of Governors and so that we can remove some of these barriers that may be unintentionally in the way. Uh, and would, if we're successful in that, we can take the performance of the, the community college system to the next level. I think that's the opportunity here uh, now that there's so much widespread interest and commitment to closing the skills gap. And my last point, and, I, and there is one, um, is that uh, the number one on the policies and recommendations on page 19 is that we prepare students for high-value jobs that currently exist in the state, and then it goes on to talk about other things. I think what I'd like to underscore, and I think it's implicit in a lot of the work you've talked about, it's not just the jobs that currently exist in the state, it's also those that we anticipate in the future. And our, this is a state that prides itself in innovation. We are turning out whole new industries that nobody's ever come up with in a span of three to five years. And some of our students aren't even out of the system by then. So I think um, your notion that this has to have innovation, flexibility, and responsiveness mm -hmm. to market conditions is essential. So I'm very happy to hear that employers are going to comprise roughly half of this task force. We need them to have some skin in the game. Um, they have de-invested in workforce training. They need to reinvest just as we are trying to reinvest in a way that's flexible and responsive to their needs. I'm very excited about this task force recommendation. I look forward to seeing you get started. Thank you. Well said. The member Subner. Thank you for <clears throat> thank you for your presentation. When I'm looking at this, I'm seeing the com it's comprised of leaders from. I don't see veterans in there. The only reason I bring that up is because you talked about the skills gap, the workforce right now, challenges, the job creation, especially with all of Veterans Day. You saw a lot of workforces. You saw a lot of job opportunities, and sometimes it's very hard to get the <coughs> communities or people to come. 
and that is a challenge. So I think that there's a lot of lessons learned from that workforce and with especially the skills gap because you've got people that are highly trained that can't get jobs. So I would just like to see maybe maybe possibly adding that or get get some lessons learned from experiences they've had the challenges with the military with the workforce. Member Lansky. Just some questions. When do you anticipate that you'll know when the workforce uh, task force is together? So that like we would be told as quickly as possible after that, just for a sense of you know, what's happening, who's on it now, who's been selected, uh, and to have some clarity, is there? So the website uh, already has some tentative dates right now. Uh, we plan to kick off the task force on January 22nd, at least we're holding the date uh, on January 22nd. So we'll be uh, doing a mad scramble uh, to, to issue invitations and get nominations onto the task force. By January 21st, then. Yes. So I, uh, uh, pardon me, uh, but I, I really expect us to have that task force uh, broadly named pretty quickly. Uh, and if it goes up on a web, could we be given uh, absolutely some kind of advance notice or notice that, you know, it's on the web, go look at it. And it says you're going to do seven to eight regional meetings and consider strategies and recommend policies and practices. One of the things that I'd like to ask also is instead of some kind of composite uh, information about these regional meetings that we get information <coughs> about the individual meetings because the different regions will be saying different things because of just where they are and what's going on in those regions. And I'd like to see those differences as, rather than some kind of composite executive summary. And I'd like to see the same with the town hall meetings because I'm assuming they'll be in five different locations and therefore, as a result, it's good to just see what different segments are saying rather than you just get this large picture that you can't drill down a little bit to or ask questions about. So there's that. And I would personally like once it's decided when the five meetings of the task force are going to happen, uh, you know, to get that calendar. I'd like to know when they are so that in case they're easily to go to, I'd like to just personally be able to go and listen to what's being said. And I would also say that when this web-based survey tool comes out uh, to ask people questions, uh, to make a great effort as to how we uh, disseminate that to get people to uh, respond to web-based survey tools. And the reason I say that is because sometimes just sending emails isn't sufficient. People don't always read email closely enough to know that they should be responding to this survey tool and from the response then provide additional information that could be quite helpful. And just a couple of other comments. I'm assuming that some of the statements made in here also might lead to uh, focusing more on dual enrollment in CTE areas because it says better aligning K-14 and K-16 and what efforts are going to have to take place there to better align and do uh, that kind of thing. And I just would like to know when the online tools to access the job infrastructure, again, how we get that out so that it gets used well rather than it gets lost. And, uh, because of this kind of career counseling and career counseling centers that we have at the colleges, uh, career counseling classes, to actually know when these online tools are available would be quite helpful to that kind of initiative for the students. Vice President Bond. I just wanted to say that uh, I think it, this looks like a very open process to me where a lot of people have opportunity for input. Um, I would agree uh, with uh, Chancellor Harris's goal to keep the task force in the mid-20s. I know it's very hard to manage a large group trying to accomplish a lot of work in a short period of time and uh, you know, not begrudging anybody uh, you know, uh, who, who wants to have a specific representative, but I, but I think it's important to make sure it's nimble and and I'm still broadly representative. Member Van? Uh, yes, so a couple of things, and um, two of which kind of piggyback off what uh, Member Belansky was talking about. Um, it's my understanding that uh, the Doing What Matters website actually has an e-subscription option um, and that I actually just found out about. Um, and Vaughn, could you elaborate upon that for us? Because I've been getting updates throughout the week, actually. Um, in regard to grants and things of that sort that could be pertinent to uh, what's being discussed here? 
Uh, yes. Uh, so we have the um, the e updates, and we intend to convert those e updates to have a column so that we're always updating on the latest with regards to the task force. Uh, and you know, in terms of outreach to students, uh, Member Van Loon just had a gathering of the Student Senate where he hosted a workshop on workforce and economic development. And we were just talking about is there a social media strategy that he could be the lead of for the students where as events happen with the task force, he's able to tweet it out and um, get the word out. So lots of ideas. Yes, and this is something that um, many of the student leaders aren't as well versed as uh, they should be upon. Um, it's the focus of a lot of student leaders uh, for the transfer model and that aspect of our system. And this is something that's uh, extremely large and important to our system and one of our missions as well. Um, so communication is key and I can't stress that enough. Um, also in regard to the composition of the task force itself, I think that it would be uh, it would be strategic to at least include one business uh, representative from each region, each of our 10 regions, to have an accurate um, reflection of our economies throughout California. And um, I'd like for Vaughn to elaborate upon um, some of the K-12 involvement we have um, because I know as a result of the budget cuts um, a couple of years prior, those were the CT programs embedded within the K-12 uh, system were some of the first to be gutted as a result of those budget cuts. So how can we use um, the concurrent enrollment legislation that we plan on evaluating later on in the meeting to try to embed our CT programs and such in the K-12 uh, system as well and foster those partnerships uh, along the way throughout all of this? Uh, uh, we, we were talking about uh, there's been a set of investments by the state in the form of the California Career Pathway Trust uh, that was discussed last time. So that there's a set of workforce conversation happening there. There's a set of uh, workforce conversation happening with the enactment of the Federal Workforce uh, Innovation and Opportunities Act uh, as well as what is going on in our system. So what we need to, to make sure are what are the things that are in the way of making these investments work together, right? How do these investments, how should they work together and what do we need to do? And, and really, I, I would defer to uh, Vice Chancellor Stewart who has been working really long and hard on the area of dual enrollment and maybe you can discuss that when, when you have a legislative briefing. Vice President Bob. Not, not, I, I, I need, wanted to go back to one thing about the composition too. One of the uh, uh, elements that I believe made the Student Success Task Force effective was actually uh, representation of the Board of Governors. Peter McDougall chaired it. Uh, President Baca was a, a member of that. Um, was, is there any thought given to that or is there a reason that it might work better not to have a member of the Board of Governors on that or to chair it? Yeah, again, we went back and forth on, on this issue. Uh, in, in the case of, of this uh, topic, at least at this point, we've elected not to put Board of Governor members on the task force. Um, although I, I think it worked out really well in the case of the Student Success Task Force, I always worry a bit that if you have the governing body uh, represented on the actual task force, it makes it awkward for then the, his or her colleagues to be critical of the end product if the person was sitting on the task force. Now, again, this is at the will of the board. If you prefer to have one or more of your colleagues on the task force, then that's the way we'll do it. At this point, that's not the way it's envisioned. Then my hope is if, if, if that's not the case, I expect that we will hear, uh, be briefed regularly at each board meeting in the coming year as to the progress of the task force. Is that uh, correct? We would certainly expect to keep you very well informed. Very good. Any further discussion? Well, Chancellor, I want to thank you for uh, bringing this to, uh, to us for an, for an approval. It's something we've talked about since the Student Success Task Force and certainly something that the field has been uh, very much uh, interested in doing. So with that, uh, I will um, place it to a vote uh, that we approve of the Task Force on Workforce, Job Creation, and a Strong Economy. All in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Nay. Okay. Um, action item number Chancellor, one. actually... Um, I have one question separate from this, uh, having nothing to do with the tax task force. Um, we had talked uh, about uh, coding as a CT course, and I know you were just at the White House 
uh, with a meeting with some folks. Could you brief the board a little bit in terms of where we're moving, in terms of opening uh, some coding courses? Obviously, this we're sitting in the Silicon Valley right now, and I'd be remiss to say that there are four coding jobs uh, for every one employee that's trained, uh, and we need folks immediately. So what's the next step? So um, Member Budnick introduced me to a, a person who I followed up with the White House, and I know that this area of coding uh, is also of interest, to, of interest to Member Van Loon. Uh, interestingly enough, when I went out to research this space, so there's a lot of coding boot camps that have occurred, and they charge somewhere between ten to $25,000 for a 10-week or 12-week boot camp. The placement rate is around 90% with a $90,000 start. So you can tell from the price point that industry is, is having a severe shortage, otherwise they would not, you know, you wouldn't have this kind of wage escalation. So the White House uh, IT initiative is, is asking us, and we concur, that there is an acute need uh, for, uh, for us to address this area of coding and uh, programming. And we're, we're looking at restructuring some of our grant opportunities to network a number of our colleges so that we can take a, a more scaled approach to address the <coughs> labor market need because it's not isolated to one area. It's pervasive across multiple regions, multiple locations in the state. So you, you should be expecting to see um, us drop some grant opportunities in the next, uh, within the next month. Thank Great. You for, thanks thanks you for your leadership. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. We will now move to a presentation uh, on action item 2.2, and that is the approval of the proposed Board of Governors 2015 sponsored legislation. President Baca, members of the board, Chancellor Harris, uh, so I have the privilege today of presenting to you the 2015 state legislative program. Can't hear you, Vince. Yeah, your mic. I'll move over. All right, it's working. Is that better? Yeah. Okay. So, uh, again, from the top. <laughs> President Baca, members of the board, Chancellor Harris, I have the pleasure of presenting to you the 2015 state legislative program for your consideration for sponsored legislation next year. Um, as outlined in your packet, we have one proposal coming forward this year, and it is actually a reintroduction, if you will, of uh, dual enrollment legislation that we sponsored last year. I will say that uh, although that legislation was not successful, we think that there's still a significant amount of interest and support around the system to move something forward. Um, however, we will want to take a close look to see if AB 1451 would be where we would want to start in the 2015 legislative session or if we would want to do something a little bit different. Um, and just a little bit by way of process and background, uh, we did go through a review through our state legislative program task force as well as the state consultation council, and there was uh, general unanimous support to move this forward to the board. That concludes my okay, presentation. I, I will not take a motion uh, for the approval of the proposed uh, Board of Governors 2015 sponsored legislation, action item 2.2. So moved. Second. Uh, Member Valansky, second. Uh, Member Stolano, uh, discussion. Member Lansky. I just want to mention some things because I'm highly supportive of this. Uh, I even want to say thank you, uh, Vice Chancellor, for being part of a presentation recently at the State Academic Football Plenary that uh, was a breakout on dual enrollment, concurrent enrollment, and the value of it and how to move ahead. And I just want to mention some things that I think that we need to continually reference as we move forward. Uh, in June of this year, the RP group uh, under the leadership of Dr. Roger Purnell, put out a study, a guide to launching and expanding dual enrollment programs for historically underserved students in California. I think we get too lost often in looking at this from the perspective of high achieving students are coming forward, and we d don't look at what can happen and what has happened nationally for underrepresented students. Uh, when they put this study together, it's got like four pages of very minute print bibliography of how much is out there to support this kind of dual enrollment project. I also want to make comment about the James Irvine Foundation work, uh, dual enrollment for all reasons and ways to make it work. 
uh, because we do have some community colleges that are involved in this. Uh, City College of San Francisco, Los Angeles City College, Santa Barbara City College. So people out there that are models and working with foundations like this need to come forward and speak very effectively about what is going on. Uh, there was also another thing called broadening the benefits of dual enrollment, reaching underachieving and underrepresented students with career-focused programs, uh, and there's just a lot that way. And one of the Last, well, there's two more things I'd like to mention. At the Strengthening Student Success uh, Conference, which I think was, what, in September? Uh, there was a presentation done by the State Academic Senate that was called Linking Students to College, an online counselor tool that works, that's being worked on by Chris Costa, the articulation liaison with the Statewide Career Pathways Project. And I think even with this dual enrollment issue, by looking at some kind of online uh, counseling tool that can be shared between high school counselors and community college counselors and what they're proposing to me would be quite effective because it would show students a plan of not just what you're taking here in high school, but what this could lead to in a community college and to get beyond it, to get an education for a very specific reason rather than sitting around and saying, well, why am I even doing all of this? And the, the final thing I'll say just to support this is I just think we should also remember that on January 30th in Sacramento, the second annual statewide collaboration on early and middle colleges and dual enrollment programs will take place. Unfortunately, I can't go, but I do think uh, the state chancellor's office is, is putting this on, and I do think that we should get the word out far and wide for people you know, to attend and to come to listen to some of the sessions. After the comment about dual enrollment, I'd like to bring up one other thing. Okay, Member Belansky. Thank you. Very I mean, uh, Member Sumi. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, again, thank you, uh, Vice Chancellor. Uh, just out of curiosity, um, you know, in the background on the item, the, the previous proposal uh, didn't make it through the State Senate. Uh, could you uh, elaborate a little bit more on uh, why, uh, what was some of the opposition, what was the basis of that, and, you know, how we're planning to meet those uh, concerns uh, by, you know, the Senate and other members of the legislature? Sure. So um, AB 1451, the previous proposal, was a relatively comprehensive piece of legislation. Where we ran into some challenges in the Senate Appropriations Committee was really around where the courses are taught, if they can be taught on a high school campus, whether or not that course is open to the general public, um, the mi minimum qualifications of faculty who would be teaching a college level course, whether or not you get high school credit versus college credit. So a lot of the details, um, there were concerns about an implementation. Would you, um, in some respects, be perhaps displacing K-12 teachers who might be teaching some of these courses? So. I think we just did not have enough time to work out those issues to where we could make folks who had expressed some, some concern and, and some opposition to get to a point to where I think we could reach consensus. So I think what we would want to do, which is why this is presented to you really in conceptual form, is to spend between now and January to sort of work through those issues and also work with potential authors to see where they might land on some of these things. Member Sumner. I just want to say I'm, I'm real supportive of this. I'm thinking back to when I went, well, a long time ago, probably 30 something years ago, I went to two separate colleges so that I could get like microbiology or physiology because I couldn't get it at my college. So I had to do two different colleges. I can see where as a collaborative with this, this would be huge to have it for junior college, high school, that, but it would have to be scheduling. Like, so for example, you wouldn't want one college to have it always at the same time. You could schedule it more. That's more of the collaborative, which ties into the task workforce in a sense. All of these student success, it's all about collaboration. It's all about working together. You know, because I've talked with students and they say they would rather pay out of their own pocket to go to a different community college to get their one class so that they then can, you know, get fast tracked into another. So. I'm highly supportive and look forward to working with this and with anything to help it. I know from the nursing perspective, that's one of the challenges is getting your micro your physiology because it's only scheduled certain times, certain teachers. But if you have community colleges working together, 
but I also know that there's challenges with the amount of credits to get the funding for, you know, scholarships and everything. But I just think this, I think it really needs to be brought back up again. Any other discussion? Member Lansky, do you have something else to add? I want to bring up another topic, but I don't, uh, I'm not looking for a respect. It's regard to legislation. Okay. And I don't, I'm not necessarily looking for a response today, but I'd like to put it out publicly because I don't know how else to necessarily do that. And the issue is around for me, because of some experiences uh, since January, is about the standalone credit course approval process being a local uh, option. And this was done legislatively because AB 1943 was chaptered in October 2006, and from fall 2007 to December 31st, 2012, they amended Ed Code to allow us to do local approval of standalone courses at the various community colleges. And we went through training and it went through a process. It was then chaptered in 2011 such that this went forward to January 1st, 2014 and could have been extended or chaptered again uh, per how the legislation was written. And I'm still a little bit confused. And again, I don't want the response here right now, but I do think that at some future point, I'd like to hear what we're gonna do or not do or why it wasn't, uh, some additional stuff was not done with this legislation about the local approval uh, because, I mean, it did expire January 1st, 2014. Nothing was really said that I'm aware of and would like to know more about it in terms of our legislative action. Very good. Duly noted. Um, now I will entertain a, uh, I will uh, ask for a vote to approve um, the proposed Board of Governors 2015 proposed legislation action item 2.2. .2. All in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, the ayes have it. Uh, action item 2.2. .2. Uh, the uh, Board of Governors 2015 sponsored legislation is approved. We will now move on to a presentation on implementation action item uh, 2.3, implementation of fall 2015 faculty obligation number. This item presents information for the Board of Governors consideration in determining whether the Budget Act of 2014 provides adequate uh, funding to support an increase in district's uh, full-time faculty hiring obligation for fall uh, 2015. Uh, Vice President Troy, I mean Vice Chancellor Troy. Yes, uh, thank you, President Baga, Chancellor Harris, and members of the board. Um, excuse me. Each November, the board is required to make a determination as to whether the current year budget has provided adequate resources for districts to implement their faculty obligation number, which is we uh, affectionately call uh, the FON. Uh, as we spoke about uh, at the retreat a bit in uh, September, uh, essentially what the, the FON does is require districts to increase uh, the number of full-time faculties they have on staff by uh, the percentage of uh, increase they have in uh, of, uh, credit uh, instruction. So if their credit FTS go up by about 3%, you would expect their FON number to go up by uh, similarly by about 3%. Um, so in analyzing this year's request, uh, I think we found that the, uh, the current year budget uh, is a very robust budget for the California Community Colleges, which is a very welcome um, change from what we had seen in some recent years where the budgets were very poor. And this board found for, I believe, five consecutive years that the budgets did not provide adequate resources for, uh, uh, for the fund to be implemented for the sub subsequent fall. fall. Uh, at this time last year, the board uh, ended that five-year uh, freeze period, as we call it, by implementing uh, the increase for the fund last year. And in looking at this year's budget, we find that the, 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 the story is an even better one for community colleges. We received uh, approximately $600 million in programmatic increases uh, for this year. That's nearly a 10% increase uh, for our system budget. Uh, that includes healthy amounts for access. Uh, it funds uh, uh, the minimum required for the state COLA. It provides a significant amount of discretionary, uh, uh, rather, uh, resources for districts for deferred maintenance and instructional equipment. Uh, it also in provided substantial increases for the triple SP program and $70 million for uh, the student equity plans. Uh, there were some other funds as well provided, but taken as a whole, we find this to be a very robust uh, budget year, and our recommendation at this time is that the, the board 
do indeed uh, find that the budget provides adequate resources to implement the fund for the subsequent year. Uh, should the board make uh, uh, should provide choose to provide that uh, that the budget does not provide adequate resources, uh, what would happen is that districts would not have uh, an increase in their fund for their for that increase in credit FTS. Uh, their their old number essentially would be frozen in place, and they can comply with the provisions uh, by either meeting that that uh, number or by um, ensuring that the percentage of full time instruction provided uh, at their at their uh, districts uh, is at, at least what it was in the prior year. So there's there's two ways that they can meet it in the in the event that we uh, 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 find that they're not adequate. However, our recommendation at this time is to go ahead and implement it for the uh, for the fall of 2015. Thank you. I will now entertain a motion, Make a motion. for the implementation of fall uh, 2015 faculty obligation number, I, action item 2.2. Make the motion. Three. Second. Motion by Member Sumner, uh, Member uh, Van Loon second. Uh, before we go to discussion, we do have one public comment uh, card. Uh, Jonathan Lightman. Thank you again, Mr. President and members. Uh, Jonathan Lyman, on behalf of the Faculty Association of California Community College. This is a very straightforward item. As Vice Chancellor Troy mentioned, the budget was very robust. Um, and, and we highly support your, uh, your approval of this. The bigger challenge is what do we do with only 56% of credit classroom instruction taught by full-time faculty. Within your BCP for 2015-16, you have a $70 million request for full-time faculty, but what we need as the Board of Governors is to continue to push this item in, in the event that the January budget does not contain this, um, this uh, funding. Um, the idea that we have such a low percentage uh, of our courses taught by full-time faculty Im impacts every aspect and every fiber of the campus. And we do have to make the argument and connect the dots for both the legislature and the administration that support for increasing the ratio and support for part-time faculty beginning with office hours contributes to student success. Thank you. Discussion? Member Epstein. Yeah, um, I have a question. I mean, I support the idea of, of having more full-time faculty, but uh, in, since we last met, the governor uh, came out quite strongly against extending the temporary taxes, and I was wondering if we'd given any uh, long-term thought to what the implications of that might be. Well, we, as uh, the board knows, the Proposition 30 sunsets in two tranches, uh, the first in 16, Dan, and the second in 18. Is that right? Yes, the uh, the sales tax ends at the end of the uh, 2016 calendar year, and then two two years later, uh, the income tax portion ends. So we're we're uh, and our, our we're certainly aware of that, and we're reminding our college of that daily. In in theory, the economy is supposed to recover to offset those uh, uh, stoppage the stoppage of those two revenue sources, um, and I. Uh, I think it's highly likely that regardless of the governor's opinion, if the economy does not uh, act as they had planned, that, that you're likely to see an attempt to get 30 renewed. But we, it's our responsibility to make certain that the colleges, from a fiscal planning purposes, know exactly what those dates are and what those uh, financial ramifications are. And we are, we are on an almost monthly basis making sure everybody's aware of that. Yes, and if I may just add to the uh, chancellor's uh, comments that you know we're very well aware that uh, while the money is coming back in for districts it's not all coming in in a discretionary <coughs> manner uh, they uh, went uh, about five years without a cola and so they had to have their purchasing power squeezed uh, during that time and 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 while these budgets have been very good and have supported a lot of activities that we're all very supportive of they haven't necessarily replenished uh, the discretionary power that uh, districts had just a few years ago um, and that's, that is an increasing concern, uh, particularly with uh, as the scheduled increases for the st employer contribution rates for STRS and PERS are going into place over subsequent years. Uh, so we discussed this issue uh, pretty extensively in consultation council. And I think while the, uh, the consensus, a strong consensus of the group was to approve uh, uh, this recommendation you see before you today uh, for this year that we are going to keep an eye uh, on those STRS contributions to see if, the, if we can't uh, get the, that issue addressed uh, in the budget uh, for subsequent years. So that is something we will be taking a, a close look at. 
Member Lansky? Maybe we were given this information, but I get so much paper that I forget stuff, so forgive me. But have we been given uh, the report showing what the faculty obligation number would be for each district and what their current uh, faculty number is such that we could do the comparison of how many more full-time faculty need to be hired? We did have information put out uh, uh, late summer based on our advance for the 14-15 year. Uh, however, I would um, note that that's not uh, yet actual information. We are just in the process right now of getting reports in for districts for how they uh, performed for the 13-14 year. So that information is not terribly up to date. Uh, but so we can, once we have that information uh, cataloged and, and, and double checked, we, we could send some information out to the board. That'd be great. And do you know by when approximately? Uh, I, I'm not sure. There, truthfully, the information is supposed to be in by now. I think we have about a dozen districts that are routinely late. Uh, so we're, hopefully we can have that information for you perhaps by January. Thank you. Thank you. Vice President Baum. I think what's I do? Uh, Member Hawk, anyone else? Any further uh, discussion? I just had a question. Um, first off, I'm very sympathetic to the comments made by Jonathan Whiteman. I feel that uh, we haven't made as, as much progress as we should on uh, making sure that each student has access to full-time faculty, and it, and it does create a, a, an important uh, resource for students, both inside and outside the classroom and in a, in a college community. In each year, a couple of districts usually will come back to the board for a waiver request because of some hardship. Do we anticipate any of those in the pipeline? Because I'd be very reluctant to consider waivers. Yeah, actually, uh, there is no authority provided in the regulation for the board to waive penalties for the FON. Uh, we do, there is authority to waive 50% uh, uh, law uh, oh, okay. exemptions, but not, not the FON. Uh, during, the, during the years of the freeze, if a district is out of compliance, uh, the penalty is deferred uh, until they come out of the freeze, uh, but they do owe they do have to pay the piper uh, at some point. Well, that's good because I, I think it is helpful, as, as Member Belansky also said, to, to see how each district is, is measuring up so that we can assess that and be aware of it. Yeah, uh, it's certainly it's a challenge for some districts, particularly if they relied during the freeze years on the percentage of instruction rather than uh, the number. They, could, they can, over time, create quite a gap between where they, uh, where they were and where they needed to be uh, when the freeze ended. Uh, I think what help districts out a little bit is that in those down years as we're being cut, they, the full-time FTS are coming down for districts, and that's reducing their fawn over that time period. So uh, it, it's, uh, the situation is uh, probably not as, as dire as you might have otherwise thought. Member Van Loon? Yes, uh, I'd like to reinforce uh, Jonathan Lightman's comments as well. Um, having a significant amount of full-time faculty on campus is a uh, extremely, extremely impactful upon the students and, and the students' success, especially because of the obligatory office hours that that entails. Um, so many students are reluctant to ask for help in the middle of class just because of the interruptions that would be incurred, and um, they really are appreciative of those office hours. And um, I think this calls for a look at maybe uh, mandating adjunct office hours as well, but. Um, I would just want to express my full support for the full implementation of the of the FON as well, just because of the uh, significant impacts that having a large number of full-time faculty on our campuses has on the students. Um, it really does foster uh, student success. Is there any further discussion? Uh, there, be, there being none, we do have a motion and a second uh, on action item uh, 2.3, the implementation of uh, fall 2015 uh, faculty obligation number. All in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 All opposed, ayes have it. Uh, action item 2.3 is uh, approved. Um, we'll move on to action item uh, 2.4, request for waiver of property use requirement, sale, use, lease, use, gift, and exchange. This item requests approval for the waiver of property use requirements, sale, lease, use, gift, exchange pursuant to the requirements of Education Code Section 81370 as authorized by Ed Code Sections 81250 uh, and 81252. We'll have a presentation. So thank you, President Bakken. That was quite a mouthful for you to, yeah. uh, to introduce. <laughs> <laughs> um, a lot of codes. Yeah. Uh, education Code uh, generally requires 
uh, boards to accept the highest seal bid they, they receive when, when trying to uh, uh, sell or lease uh, property, as, as, the, as President Baca uh, detailed in his introduction. Uh, education code also allows, under circum certain circumstances, the Board of Governors to waive those provisions. Uh, at the top of page, uh, near the top of page 33 in the analysis, you see what some of the conditions are required uh, for a board to, uh, uh, to, uh, to pass if they wish to make this requirement, as the San Jose Evergreen District has uh, in this case. Uh, the district needs to conduct a uh, public hearing with proper notice, uh, both to their community and to local governmental agencies that they have land uh, available for, for uh, use should the local government uh, feel the need to uh, procure a bid there. Uh, they have to declare uh, the property to be surplus, and they have to provide that the, the waiver will not uh, increase any state uh, costs or decrease state revenues for a system. So the San Jose Evergreen District has some surplus uh, property uh, available. They are requesting the, that the board waive the uh, highest a sealed bid requirement so that they can look at other uh, other factors in their determination for the use of the land. Uh, they are particularly interested in assuring that uh, the land is used for uh, educational purposes. Uh, they're interested in, in ensuring that um, uh, how the land is developed is works uh, aesthetically with the uh, other community uh, needs. Uh, and with that in mind, they're asking for a bid today. Uh, in our analysis, they check the boxes that are required for approval, and therefore we are recommending approval uh, today. Good. Thank you. I will now entertain a motion for action item 2.4, request for waiver of property use requirements, sale, lease, use, gift, and exchange. I motion. So, uh, Member Budnick, motion. Second. Uh, second. Second. Member Subner. Uh, before we have a discussion of the board uh, uh, members, uh, we do have public comment. Maria Fuentes, a trustee from the San Jose Evergreen Community College District. Good afternoon. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to address you this afternoon. Um, I have a letter that I've just distributed and I'm just going to take a few minutes to read this. Dear members of the Board of Governors, I have served six terms as trustee of the San Jose Evergreen Community College Governing Board. And after not being reelected, I will be leaving the board at the end of this month. The San Jose Evergreen Community College District is thriving. The chancellor, the presidents, other executives, the faculty, classified staff, and managers are exceptional and fully dedicated to the success of our students. I have been honored to serve as trustee of this district. As a resident of San Jose, I will continue to be concerned about the district and hope to continue contributing to it as a private citizen. I'm here today to request that you use caution and thoroughness as you consider the request for waiver of property use for the San Jose Evergreen Community College District. I will address two concerns within the context of the document you have received from Chancellor Bryce Harris. Release from the highest bid analysis. Certainly the financial analysis for this project is complex. However, as it is indicated on, in board meeting agendas, the district is negotiating with Republican Urban Properties, LLC, concerning price and payment in a non-binding letter of intent. For the public RFP, the project will have retail, housing, and other uses. Due to the size and value of this land to the public, it must be a clear expectation that though the district may receive a waiver, it must still make every effort to conduct a highest bid analysis. It should be expected that the lease agreement be conducted with a complete analysis using the specific components of the proposal being negotiated to determine the highest market value of the land to be leased. I believe this was promised in the March 9, 2004 board resolution when the 27, 27 acres were declared as surplus college property, stating, quote, the board hereby announces its intention to dispose of the site or any portion of the site at fair market value. 
The second concern is Evergreen Valley College needs need for part of the surplus land. The original declaration of the 27 acres as surplus land occurred in 2004. I was at that time a member of this board. Since that time, an active earthquake fault which lies below two classroom buildings at EVC have been discovered, causing the loss of college land for EVC. In addition, since the college's needs to respond to high educational demands has grown. Chancellor Bryce's document states, quote, the recently completed update of the district's master plan indicates the campus does not need the site for future use, end of quote. This statement is no longer correct. You have 30 seconds. I didn't know I have a time, had a time limit. Well, let me, let me make a conclusion here and, and get to my end recommendation. And that is that if you approved a waiver, but please consider including the highest bid analysis required by the educational code. If you grant this waiver, please request a report pertaining to the project's adherence to the need for land at EVC and that the project provides high market value to the district and the public. I hope you will read the rest of my letter. I'm sorry, I did not realize that I had a time limit. Thank you very much. And we do have the, the letter. And I just uh, would let all the speakers know, too, as you'll see on the bottom of the speaker card, it's speakers are limited to three minutes each. And I, I apologize for not mentioning that previously. Okay, board member discussion? Member Spano? Um, Board member, uh, Vice Chancellor Tri do we know how long the lease is contemplated for this property? Uh, my understanding is that it's not complete yet, so I, I think it depends on uh, uh, the negotiation and or bids that the, that the campus receives, so that's not been determined to, to my knowledge. May I ask uh, Ms. Fuentes that question? Do you mind if can, th please come to the front? I just have a couple questions. But I ask you to be extremely brief, okay, extremely brief. How long is the lease being contemplated for, to your knowledge? 50 to 99 years. Okay. And if you know, to your knowledge, um, when you talk about this earthquake fault below two classrooms buildings, do you know the approximate size of the square footage that can no longer be used, or even the acreage that can no longer be used as a result of this earthquake fault? Um, I don't know, but recently the um, president of the faculty summit um, comment that the that the campus needs to be moving west in order to accommodate this. Okay, and then Vice Chancellor Troy, if I might ask, um, it, this letter talks about there being a master plan. I know all the campuses have to have that. Do you know whether this needs to be updated next year? Uh, I, I think it's possible that the district is in the process of updating its master plan, but their most recently approved master plan does not include the use of this land, is my understanding. Okay. And this land is off-site from the campus. It's not adjacent. I, I, the map is it's, impossible to read in black and white, so I can't even really see. Yes, it's, it's actually, as I, I, I believe it's adjacent to the campus. So it is adjacent. It's not like somewhere off away from the campus. It's, Correct. It's, okay. Um, Okay. Any other questions? I, I, before we proceed, I, I think we need to entertain a motion for the item. Did so moved. Did we already it was do so it? moved. Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry, slipped up. Who made the motion? Sumner and Buckner. What did right. the motion? That's right. Thank you very much. I'm distracted here for a second. All right, um, Member Van Loon. Yeah, so I'd just like to ask if, um, when was the master, the last master plan approved? Um, was it approved before the fault was uh, discovered? Uh, unfortunately, I'm not aware of when the plan was approved, uh, the date of that. Okay, could we possibly uh, um, get Ms. Fuentes. Fuentes up here to answer that question? The um, master plan was approved. The last one ha did not have the earthquake fault. And also when we asked for this land to be a surplus land, we were not aware there was an earthquake fault. 
that was active. So just to clarify, it was deemed surplus land before the discovery of the fault. Any further discussion? Just, uh, yeah, uh, just, uh, um, I mean, I don't know how much level of detail you know, Vice Chancellor Troy, on this. Um, this is 27 acres in San Jose, extremely valuable property. And so I, I see the attachment about wanting to have considerations other than highest bid, like the project design and the um, other benefits. Um, but once we declare, once we waive the need for highest bid, or is there any requirement that they evaluate the various bids, at least by that factor? Bid A came in at X amount, bid B came in at a little bit less, but we, it's almost like a statement of overriding considerations in CEQA, but we choose to go with bid B because of the additional benefits it will require. Is there any requirement that they do that kind of weighing? Uh, yes, and, and it's certainly in the district's interest to look look at the economic economic benefit uh, to the to the district to ensure that they're. Not, I'm sure they're not just going to give the property uh, away. Such as you mentioned, it's in San Jose. This is not uh, cheap real estate uh, we're talking about. Uh, but the analysis of the projects is going to be a fairly complicated one, I think, at the at the local level, given the uh, competing uh, types of proposals they're likely to see. And I, and I think in order to ensure that the project meets other district goals, they would like to not be tied into ex having to accept the highest bid that they receive. Vice President Baum. My question is on Exhibit 3, page 37. So how is the uh, district held accountable that whatever decision they make complies with these factors for consideration? Uh, these actions are the result of uh, board approved uh, actions, so they are they are required to maintain those um, uh, to comply with those actions. Right. Our, and so we're not auth we're authorizing them to do if they move forward to uh, developing this property, they have they are obliged to comply with these uh, correct requirements. But after we give them the authority to do that, we have no ability to oversee whether they met those other than their legal action. There's no oversight that the Board of Governors provides to ensure Does it come back compliance. To uh, it, doesn't it doesn't on the natural come back to the Board, but it is an, an issue that we will monitor for sure. Right, that's an important. And in, in your sense, you're recommending that you f feel that the district will faithfully follow these uh, conditions. Uh, uh, correct, and in fact, I would point to the conditions, under, again, on the top of uh, page 33 that they had to comply with. Uh, in order to get to this point today, uh, there's a lot of public hearing and information that had to take place in order for them to take uh, this vote and, and bring this uh, recommendation to the board today. And then so, so, go ahead. Go ahead. so it's conceivable that it could come back to us based on your oversight, and how would that occur? I, I think if we feel that the district um, uh, went back on the deal, so to speak, if that's the, the concern. That is certainly an issue that we can bring to the, ten the attention of the board. Uh, Vice President Bob, did you have something? I was just going to say, though, as a former local elected trustee, too, I, I do believe in the principle of allowing districts to uh, have as much autonomy as possible because they are the ones on the front line of determining what's best for their immediate district. So I, I in, in generally support that uh, philosophy. Member Sumner. With uh, reading this when you were talking about the um, earthquake fault line, I mean, that really concerns me because it's just not going to go through two classroom, classrooms. We know earthquakes. I mean, so it's like when we say we're losing some uh, acreage here, I would think that the cost is going to be un probably unbelievable as far as, you know, insurance-wise, seismic, has there been a seismic report and everything because that's my concern as far as what's going to happen if there is right, a fault line going right down there. You've lost two classrooms. What is the seismic report up in that area of state as far as those 27 acres? Yes, uh, it could be an issue, but our, I mean, again, our, our assumption is that under local control that the district had this option and considered that, uh, that analysis before requesting the, the recommendation. 
Is there any further discussion? Uh, there being none, uh, then we'll take a vote on action item 2.4, request for waiver. Request a roll call. Requirements. I'm sorry, Mr. President, request a roll call. Sure. Uh, request uh, for waiver of property use uh, requirements, sale, lease, use, gift, and exchange. Uh, Ms. Gilmer, if we could have a roll call vote, please. Yes. Aye. Joseph Polanski? Aye. Scott Budnick? Aye. Thomas Epstein? Aye. Cecilia Estolano? No. Danny Hawkins? Abstain. Lance Azumi? Aye. Nancy Sumner? Aye. Colin Van Loon? No. Okay, uh, the, the ayes have it. Uh, action item uh, 2.4, request for waiver of property use requirements, sale, lease, use, gift, and exchange. Uh, is approved. We will now move on to uh, action item 2.5, uh, fiscal independence uh, uh, request. Uh, this item request a requ uh, this item presents a request for fiscal independence status pursuant to Ed Code uh, 85266.5 from Santa Barbara City Community College District and Southwest uh, Western Community College District to be effective July 1st, 2015. Vice Chancellor Troy. Uh, thank you, President Baca and members. Uh, under uh, normal practice and under the education code for uh, our, our system, uh, county, county offices, either the county office of education or the county auditor, depending on the local region, uh, is, uh, uh, issues the warrants on behalf of the community college district. I believe this is more or less a relic of our, uh, uh, of our colleges being a product of the K-12 uh, system. Uh, uh, education code, however, does provide the authority for the Board of Governors to grant what we call fiscal independence for some districts to uh, issue their own warrants without having that, um, that uh, oversight on the part of the uh, relevant county office. Um, in the case of uh, the two districts we have before us today, we have the Southwestern Community College District and the Santa Barbara Community College uh, District. Uh, law does require that they have, a pr in order to be, for this independence to be in effect, for the next fiscal year, so for July 1st, uh, we have to have board approval before January 1st uh, of this year. So that's, uh, that explains the timing of the issues before you today. Uh, when districts do request, uh, or rather pursue fiscal independence, uh, they have to work with their relevant county office, and uh, which that causes a, uh, uh, the hiring of a CPA uh, to uh, inspect the internal fiscal controls uh, of the district to assure that they have adequate, re uh, adequate uh, staffing and internal controls present at the district in order to uh, uh, perform their own, uh, issue their own warrants without that review by their county office. Uh, in the cases of both districts, uh, the county offices have uh, had that, uh, had that uh, uh, audit to cause to be, to be done. Uh, and in analyzing that information, they have provided, both county offices have provided recommendations of approval for fiscal independence for these two districts before us today. Uh, in conducting a RON analysis, we do look at the, the checklist at the top of page 40. Uh, essentially, we're trying to make sure that the districts have a history of, of having adequate reserve, reserves and fund balances on hand, uh, that their governing board and the district's um, our, uh, staff has been able to show that they can uh, uh, act uh, uh, in accordance with the law and make sure their funds go out uh, uh, legally uh, and that they have adequate internal controls. Uh, there are processes that are in place that ensure uh, integrity of the proceedings and that they have adequate staffing and resources uh, to ensure that, um, <clears throat> that this, they're capable of handling this, their own uh, scrutiny of their, of their fiscal actions. Uh, so, uh, before we, so for both of these districts, we found uh, the county offices have recommended approval of fiscal, fiscal independence, and our uh, review has uh, uh, concurred in that assessment. So that's our recommendation for you today. Uh, with us in the audience, we do have representatives from uh, both districts here. If you do have further questions, uh, we have Melinda Dish, the president of Southwestern Community College, and uh, Joseph Smith, who's the vice president of business services for the Santa Barbara Community College District. Very good. Uh, I will now entertain a motion for action item 2.5, uh, fiscal independence request from Santa Barbara City 
San Barbara Community College District and Southwestern Community College District to be effective July 1st, 2015. Move approval. Second. second. Member Stolano. And second is Member Hawkins. Um, any public comment? No public comment. Okay. Uh, move to board discussion. Uh, Vice President Moss. Just uh, one question because we are moving and we've established that tech technical uh, assistance and review unit. Does it impact our ability as a system to assess the, uh, the physical health of a district base on whether they are independent or not? Uh, no, I think this is by and large a fairly technical issue from our standpoint. I, I, most of our districts are not uh, fiscally independent. I think r right now only nine of our 72 uh, have attained that status. Uh, so I, I think what, the, what we see are districts make over, come to a variety of, um, uh, of, uh, of, of, of findings on this issue. Some of them find it more convenient to have the county office perform some of these services for them. Uh, maybe they're not at, uh, sufficiently staffed uh, in their accounting uh, in business services unit to take on some of these activities and they're simply comfortable with allowing the county to continue to do that for them. Uh, so I, th I think a district can be in fine fiscal shape, uh, whether they're independent in this regard or not. And it doesn't handicap our ability to assess that? No, because it, it really only deals with their interactions with the county of who's issuing, issuing the warrants or not. Mayor Epstein. I just wondering, if, are these two districts in compliance with all of the various scorecards and metrics we use to uh, evaluate the, uh, the districts? Uh, to my knowledge, yes. I mean, certainly I did not look at the academic issues uh, confronting the districts. I was concerned more with their internal controls and some of their fiscal checks, such as uh, reserve balances. Uh, but uh, to my understanding, they're, uh, they're doing, performing uh, okay. I'm getting the nod from Patrick Perry. So. Um, can we possibly bring forth the representatives from the, these districts for a question? Yes, please. Sure. So I see um, here that all but six of the 64 requirements for fiscal independence were met. Uh, I was wondering if you um, knew what the six were and what is being done um, in the district to address those six for Santa Barbara, as well as the um, six, it seems, for Southwestern as well. Why don't we, can we start with uh, Southwestern? Uh, yes, sure. Good afternoon, President Baca, Chancellor Harris, and members of the board. Uh, my name is Melinda Nish. I'm the superintendent president at Southwestern Community College District. Um, there were uh, six areas that were identified with the audit report, and we have actually addressed all of those. We've been working very closely with the San Diego County Office of Ed, um, and most importantly, what we're doing is finalizing the written procedures putting a permanent internal auditor in place. And then we had uh, some reporting structure that they, we were given recommendations on and made those changes accordingly. Those were the recommendations from the San Diego County of Ed. Okay. Thank you. And there were only two recommendations for um, the auditors for Santa Barbara City mm -hmm. College. Um, one was the bonding of all employees who have access to cash, checks, electronic payments, or other similar property and uh, that bonding has been done and performing an evaluation of the necessary skills required for the internal audit function and determining whether the currently assigned staffing level is sufficient to achieve the objectives listed in the California Community College District application for fiscal independence and again um, we have performed that evaluation and assigned the tasks accordingly. Perfect, thank you guys very much. Are there any other uh, questions by members of the uh, board? Uh, there being none, I will not entertain a motion to. Uh, the second uh, we have the motion on the floor. I'm, I'm sorry. I will not entertain. Uh, I will now have a vote <laughs> on action item 2.5 fiscal independence request from Santa Barbara City or Santa Barbara Community College District and Southwestern uh, Community College District, uh, effective July 1st, uh, 2015. All in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Uh, opposed? There being none, uh, that action item, action item 2.5, fiscal independence request, is approved. Thank you. 
We will now move on to um, action item 2.6, uh, Board of Governors meeting dates for 2016. So I move the uh, proposed uh, schedule of meeting dates. I second. Okay. A motion and a second. Is there any discussion? Uh, we will be having a, uh, a um, recommendation for the off site uh, in January. It will be on your January agenda. All right. Okay. All in favor, uh, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposition? There being none, action item 2.6 is approved. We are going to move to a break, but before we go to that break, uh, we will return for the action item 2.7 and the first uh, uh, readings for uh, 3.1 and 3.2, and then proceed to uh, uh, information reports item 4.3, City College of San Francisco Local Control Plan. Uh, five minute break. Uh, so we will now have a five-minute break. The only person who went against this word has been helping me. Yeah, so I, much. I, you know, the whole idea of an earthquake fall under oh. Kima, yeah, it's like if it's good, if there's an earthquake, yeah. it's going to affect the whole campus. <laughs> I wish there was anybody to see I love what you do and I love what you do. 